So in this lecture we'll be looking uh, more at the physical geography of the Middle East. Um, one of the things you'll notice right away about this part of the world is that a lot of the land is a very brown color. Um, this is because of a lack of rainfall. This is because of the Tropic of Cancer and the equator being in this vicinity. What happens at the Tropic of Cancer, because it's uh, the closest part of the Earth to the Sun, it gets very hot there and, uh, and the air rises um, up into uh, the higher reaches of, of the atmosphere and uh, when it does that it loses its moisture and it dumps a lot of water as rain onto the ground and you can see where the um, equator is that there's a lot of rainfall so this uh, air then circulates around and comes down to the earth again around about where the tropics are and as you can imagine it's very very dry air and so that's exactly where we can see there's a whole lot, lot of no rain falling on the earth, uh, particularly in the Middle East. But there are parts which where it does rain, and so you can see the mean annual rainfall is in parts of the Middle East, Middle East sufficient to grow crops, um, but most of it on this map now looks rather yellow. The fertile bit used to actually be called the Fertile Crescent, which in many ways is kind of insulting to everywhere else, um, because a lot of interesting things happened to everywhere else. So in this uh, rainfall zone, in this Fertile Crescent, it actually is very green um, and very nice. There's trees, whole forests. Just think of the Cedars of Lebanon, for instance. This is actually Western Syria. But there are extremes at the other end. This, for example, is the empty quarter, the, the Arub al Khali, um, which is just desert. It's somewhere you don't really want to go to. Um, the, the deep desert, the dune seas, are basically somewhere where you might go to and really not enjoy it very much and want to get away from there as quickly as possible. So if you have to be in the desert, you need to be concerned about water. In uh, the desert of Syria uh, is a place where I used to work called Dir Marmuza, the monastery of St. Moses. Dir Marmuza, right there, you see. And it looks like this. And it dates from the fifth century. And um, it relies on the very little rainfall that occurs. You can see it's at the head of a wadi, a dry riverbed, which at certain times of the year there is actually some rain. Uh, but it's not a lot, and so you need to keep it somewhere. And so all the way up this wadi there are these caves, often lined with plaster, where the monks would store the water. And even under the main monastery building itself, there are cisterns where they would keep the water that had been collected from the building itself. And so it's very important to retain this water um, throughout the drier seasons. At other places, uh, nature does this for them. Um, there is a natural water in the middle of the desert. This is what you might call an oasis. Uh, this oasis is actually called Palmyra, or Tadmor. Palmyra is what the Romans and the Greeks called it. Tadmor is what the Arabs call it to this day. Um, you can see here the, the ancient architecture, uh, particularly very uh, developed in the second century AD. And behind that are trees and plants and the oasis, because groundwater comes to the surface here and there is an abundance of uh, wildlife and the ability to create a living. This is why Palmyra was at the center of a massive trade network in this part of the world. You can see um, the roads. This is from about the second century. These are all Roman era routes um, going up through the green bits where all the cities are. 
but to get across the desert you need the oases and so when this oasis was uh, uh, not dangerous to get to for instance during the, the Roman era uh, the, it got a lot of uh, traffic going through it once you have somewhere like this it is possible to to eke a living out of the edges of the desert where there's a little bit of rainfall and some plants are growing. You can uh, have livestock and uh, live the good life. Now this is uh, quite an interesting map. It was uh, created in Sicily but by a chap from the Middle East called Aladrisi. Uh, in 1154 and it's the world when he made it he he made it upside down for what our common perception is with north at the top he had south at the top so it's upside down here um, looking at the Middle East and you can see here here's the Indian Ocean here's the Mediterranean here's Arabia here's the Nile um, the rivers and the mountains are, are very important um, and you can see sort of down, towns dotted around. So the rivers are clearly something of significance. It so happens in the Middle East we have some very big rivers. Um, the Nile, for instance, is the biggest river in the world, over 6,000 kilometers. Then there's the Euphrates, number 20, <clears throat> at uh, over 3,000 kilometers. The Tigris is just below 2,000. There's also the Amudaria, uh, sometimes also called the Oxus, and the Sirdaria. So, so some of these are very big rivers, uh, and they come from places where there is rainfall. Uh, the Nile comes from Lake Victoria. It has an, another, the Blue Nile comes from Ethiopia, where there's massive rainfalls, and in fact most of the, the rain that floods Egypt comes from Ethiopia. Uh, the Tigris and Euphrates create what is was often called Mesopotamia by the Greeks, the land of the two between the two rivers, and uh, irrigates all of Iraq. Uh, the Tigris and Euphrates, no, that's the Tigris and Euphrates. The Amudaria and the Sirdaria uh, drain the Hindu Kush and uh, the Himalayas and go down into the Aral Sea. Here is the Nile and you can see how according to Aladrisi in 1154 it came from big lakes in Central Africa and a smaller lake up in the mountains of Ethiopia. Uh, oddly enough uh, this was forgotten and in the 19th century it seemed a big deal for white Europeans to find the source of the Nile even though Aladrisi uh, seemed to have a vague idea where it was. So the Nile is a very important river, obviously, uh, since it starts off somewhere very wet and goes down to the sea and goes through somewhere where there's absolutely no cause to have life at all. It is basically why there is an Egypt. Uh, all the water that goes through Egypt uh, is in the Nile. And so it floods, it uh, irrigates the land, and is pretty essential for that alone. Uh, along its length it's pretty navigable uh, for most of the time. Uh, one of the useful things about the Nile is it goes in the opposite direction to the way the wind goes and so the wind can blow ships upstream and of course the stream of the river will take, pe take uh, ships downstream. So um, it's just very good. There are some rapids uh, and other impassable places which probably weren't a, a possible to get by in earlier times, but you know, these are quite high up the Nile. And of course it floods, everyone knows about the flooding of, of the Nile, and it uh, there's a very beneficial flood that happened just as you wanted to uh, start plowing afterwards after the inundation went and then grow your crops. So it was a very benevolent river to the Egyptians. The Tigris and Euphrates, however, were uh, not quite the same. Uh, here is uh, the Tigris and Euphrates in Iladrisi. It's quite interesting to see that the Euphrates 
doesn't seem to end in the sea. Uh, it seems to end in a series of, of lakes. Uh, this is, shows you the perception of map makers in this time that they could only see what they could see and the river would end up in the marshlands which up until relatively recent times covered large areas of Iraq and so the uh, the rivers would come down and go into these these vast marshlands and open areas of, of fresh water <clears throat> along their length they are navigable and so all sorts of stuff would go up and down them uh, including for instance here you have some neo-assyrians moving logs uh, originally from uh, the lebanon down river to where they're going to put a building up so the Sir Daria and the Amudaria here is uh, their area going down to the uh, Sea of Azov, rising um, in the Hindu Kush and going to this massive lake, which, you know, not the Aral Sea rather. Um, and so uh, these were so important that in ancient times, the people of the Middle East would think of this entire area, including it's quite often its capital Samarkand, was the, the land over the Oxus, uh, uh, on the other side of the Abu Daria, the Transoxiania. So that leads us to these other blue areas, because that's where the rivers go down, is down to the sea. And so as I said at the beginning of the last lecture, uh, there are two things, there's the ground and there's the sea. So the sea is not actually a margin, a, a barrier uh, to people. It's a focal area. Like most parts of the world, the people that live there call it home. People that live in the desert couldn't imagine living anywhere else. People that live on the sea are sea people. They like boats, they like mess around boats, and it's quite a natural place for them to be. Uh, and so we have very early evidence of people moving around on boats. Uh, elsewhere in the world, we have evidence of people moving around on boats going back to 80,000 years ago. Uh, for instance, peopling of Australia would have required boats um, 80,000 years ago. The latest uh, data I've heard is that people have been in Australia for 80,000 years. So in the Mediterranean, we have the Cardiumware culture, which brought agriculture about 10,000 years ago out into the Mediterranean um, in Italy in about 6,500 BC and in southern Europe uh, in about 4,700 BC. And so this is not like, let us sail to the other end of the Mediterranean people. These are people toddling along, along the shore in their little boats and spreading over thousands of years. But still, there are they are sea, they are sea people moving along the water. The sea peoples, however, were a a uh, rather less positive thing. Uh, this is a very famous uh, relief of the defeat of sea peoples by Ramses the uh, Third, who went between 1186 and 1155, which was a big thing for them. The sea peoples come from well, no one really knows where they came from. There are lots of hypotheses. In some cases, we have a vague idea where they came from. Some of them would be Greeks. Um, others came from other places. For instance, the Sheridan, one of these groups, uh, recognized by their pointy hats, um, may be related to Sardinians. More Sardinians are related to Sheridan, uh, one or the other. Later on uh, in the Iron Age, we have um, bigger ships. We have more capable sailors, possibly, uh, who, after developing seafaring for some time, and we have an entire lecture on ships later on in the course, um, decide to actually sail across the entire uh, Mediterranean Sea and establish colonies. Uh, the Phoenicians uh, would have been very much capable of seafaring. Uh, they would have been involved with the 
trade in timber from Syria and Lebanon to Egypt since the Bronze Age and of course probably very much involved with the trade in copper from Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus is actually so named because it's a source of copper and of course in the Bronze Age you need copper. I'll tell you more about that in the metals class of course. So they established colonies in the 8th and 6th century uh, in North Africa and Spain and in Italy and of course there are the Greeks. The Greeks were very very uh, keen on boats. Uh, probably something to do with the fact that they live on islands and it's very easy to say oh there's another ice, nice island over there I want to go and have a look. And so they're very boaty people and also then went and spread around the entire Mediterranean. Um, this is classic colonialism in some ways. They went and probably stole other people's land. But mostly they were probably following pre-existing trade routes across the sea and establishing uh, bases there and colonies actually having people live there. So the Indian Ocean is on the other side of the Middle East and is also not so much a barrier but more a highway. Uh, there's the Indian Ocean, of course, the Gulf. We used to call it the Persian Gulf until 1979, when a lot of people insist we call it the Arab Gulf. And it is pretty much a thing. I'm sure Persians think of it as the Persian Gulf, and the Arabs seem to think of it as the Arabian Gulf. Um, but I'm just calling it the Gulf for now. And, of course, the Red Sea. Um, the Indian Ocean was involved in the uh, movement of early humans, the first modern humans, out of Africa to uh, the Yemen. And of course, to get they would have had to have been on boats. It's possible they walked all the way around the Red Sea, uh, but it's more likely they come across on a boat. And they spread along a coastal route and eventually ended up in um, Australia, of course, where we know 80,000 years ago they would have had to get boats to get there at all. So. Later on, in the Capolithic period, uh, trade to the uh, copper-rich areas of Oman would be very important. And then later on, of course, the civilization of the Indus Valley would be a very important trade contact with Mesopotamia and Egypt. And uh, large amounts of materials would go to the Indus and vice versa. And of course we have Punt. Punt is uh, somewhere around here, uh, probably. And um, we have this awesome relief at the Royal Ontario Museum, which you should go and look at sometime, uh, from the reign of Hatshepsut, who died in 1458. It's from actually her mortuary temple. And uh, it shows the expedition to Punt, where they sailed down there met the locals, got some local resources, trees, here's some trees here you see they're carrying back, and um, of course ivory and things like that. So this showed how important long distance trade was. So there you go. So we have the rivers, the rain, sorry, the rain, falls in the mountains, or at least those mountains that have rainfall, um, and flows down to the sea. The people move around, some of them move in the desert, some of them live by the rivers, more of them will probably live by the rivers in fact. Some of them live in the areas of high rainfall, and a lot of them will actually just be on the beach, sailing along, having a nice time. Thank you.